Okay, today we're going to cut the crap and talk about the top three prattles regarding the Toyota Tundra engine recall with its twin turbo V6 that is destroying main bearings. Let's get right to it. <laughs> Uh, well, I heard that the twin turbo uh, V6 has uh, it has a a problem with the uh, bottom end of it. It wasn't designed correctly. It has a girdle and it's not strong, and that's what's causing the main bearing failures. Oh, I understand, Betty. That's what Fred said. He's going down to the Dollar General. He's going to get to the bottom of it. This is the bottom end of the V6 twin turbo engine in your Tundra. This is not an engine girdle or a crankshaft girdle. Instead, this is known as a crankshaft bed plate. This is not a downgrade. This is not Mickey Mouse. This is not the problem. This is an upgrade. This is over-engineering. Make no mistake about it. This bed plate is actually out of the twin-turbo V6 that had one of the issues. And as you can see here, instead of having individual main bearing caps, one, two, three, four, you get this whole cage assembly that has been around forever. Yes. That's right. This is not new. This is not a novel design. Toyota didn't do anything radical. These have been around for decades. And this is more expensive than using traditional main bearing caps or using what people are wrongly calling this an engine girdle. This is an engine girdle. And somehow, somewhere, it got started <laughs> This theory that this Ford EcoBoost engine girdle is somehow stronger, somehow stronger than the crankshaft bed plate that I just showed you. The fact of the matter is this is a weaker design. This is a cheaper design. All this is, and this is an engine girdle, is just truss work going from one side of the engine block to the other and it ties into the normal crankshaft main bearing caps underneath. This engine has normal traditional uh, main bearing caps underneath and this truss work just ties the ends together. This is a weaker design. This is known as a girdle or girdle plate. As you can see here, this is a girdle plate. This is simply a stiffener and it's a flat piece of metal. Some are thicker, some are thinner but you can see here that it does not incorporate the main bearing caps. They're just tied in through these bolt holes. And this essentially acts as a stiffener plate. This is the cheaper option. Yes, I know the Ford one looks fancy because it's diagonal and cross and left and right. But all that is is what you see here. A old-fashioned girdle plate or girdle stiffener. These girdle stiffeners are usually sold as an aftermarket, afterthought girdle kit and they're like an add-on type of thing. This particular one is on a BMW and as you can see all it is is a stiffener plate. It's flat. It looks like it's no more than a quarter inch thick and you have traditional main bearing caps. That's what these things are where these bolt holes are and it's just stiffening the side of the engine up and giving it, giving it more rigidity. Your Ford EcoBoost is the same exact thing. It ties in through this truss work one side to the other and you have regular old main bearing caps underneath. This is the weaker design, not the stronger design. It's the cheaper design, not the more expensive design. This is a crankshaft bed plate and you can immediately <laughs> see the difference here. This is a thick, reinforced slab of block material, in this case aluminum, it is thick. It has the main bearing end caps integrated within the whole assembly. It's thick. It ties it together in every direction. It's got truss work on the outside, the inside. It's hollowed out, blah, blah, blah. You can see that this is the over-engineered solution. 
That's why Toyota has put it on their twin turbo V6. It's not an afterthought. It's not a downgrade. It's to strengthen the engine. People say the twin turbo V6 has too much pressure, blah, blah, blah. That's what this is for. That's why Toyota did this. So when we look at the twin turbo V6, we see that it has a beefy, strong, overbuilt crankshaft bed plate. And as mentioned, this is not new technology. Every last manufacturer of normal engines, turbo gasoline engines, and turbo diesel engines have had these bed plates for decades. The crankshaft goes down here. It's meant to make the whole thing stronger instead of having normal Mickey Mouse uh, main bearing caps. Not a new design, not a novel design. This is an upgrade, not a downgrade. Here is your typical 90s era Toyota Corolla four-cylinder engine. What do you see here? Oh, you see what Toyota always does to their engines, which is over-engineer them. This is a 90s era Toyota crankshaft bed plate. It's been around forever. But these are not just in Toyotas, they're in every manufacturer. They have been around forever. It's impossible to even list them all. The crankshaft bed plate is not the reason for Toyota Tundra or twin turbo V6 Toyota engine failures at all. We'll get to that in a second. But Wilma, I heard that the re I heard that this twin turbo V6 engine debuted on the Lexus LS 500 in 2017 and the Lexus LS 500 is a car engine. So Toyota is putting a car engine in their Tundra and that's why it's failing. It can't handle the increased pressure, stretches, and towing that a Tundra demands of it. They put a car engine inside of a Tundra. That's where Toyota went wrong. That's right, Betty. Fred told me the same thing. He's going down to the Dollar General right now to check it out. Well, the truth of the matter is yes. It, the engine did start out in the Lexus LS500 sedan in 2017. It's been on the road that long. But it's only in one car and five trucks. That's right. This engine from the jump off was designed and engineered to go into trucks. How do we know it? Land Cruiser 300, Sequoia, Tundra, GX 550, and the LX 600. The engineers were told to make a truck engine. They just simply put it in the LS 500 first because it was time for the LS 500 in its life cycle to get a new engine. So they shoved the truck engine in the car. But make no mistake about it, this thing was designed to go into trucks, which is why you see it in five trucks, including Toyota's flagship pride and joy, the real Land Cruiser 300 in the world market. It's a truck engine. But Wilma, I, the Toyota is not telling the truth. They say they left engine debris inside the engine and it destroyed the engine. But if that were true, it wouldn't just destroy the number one main bearing. Instead, all of the shavings would go all throughout the engine and destroy other parts of the engine. Toyota has to be lying because engine shavings surely would destroy the entire engine, not just the number one bearing. Yes, Betty, I heard the same thing. Fred's going down to the Dollar General to check it out. Your car's engine has an oiling system which runs in parallel, not series. That literally means if there's a milling problem down here where the number one main bearing gets fed, it's only going to affect the number one main bearing. Your oil is down here, it gets strained, it goes to your oil filter back here, and then look at this, it splits off into multiple directions. We call that a parallel circuit. One of the first places in this first parallel circuit that it goes is down here to the number one main bearing. Let's take a closer look. So according to Toyota, 
they left trash somewhere in this main port here, this main oilway or oil passageway that feeds the number one bearing. This is your number one main bearing. And as you can see, the oil flow is going to be here in the middle. Some is going to go to the rest of the engine. Some's going to go up here to the top of the engine. And some's going to go over here to the left to your number one main bearing. If trash is left here, Toyota is saying that the trash dislodged and the pressure of the engine operation, not the oil flow pressure, but the uh, uh, radial or upward and downward pressures, think of it like a, a hydraulic press, is forcing that engine trash or shavings or whatever you want to call it. I know there's a technical word for it, but uh, let's just call it trash. The shavings get pressed down into the bearing here, the number one bearing, and screw it up. And people go, how can that happen? Be, it not ruin the rest of the engine because it's a parallel circuit. So if the problem is right here where the mouse is, the trash is going to get moved right to the next place it wants to go, which is the number one main bearing journal or journal or slash bearing area. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Why doesn't it go to the rest of the engine? Because it goes to the number one main bearing and then it goes to the number one uh, rocker bear, or excuse me, number one um, rod bearing, connecting rod bearing. That's it. That's the end of its journey here. It goes down and circulates. Doesn't go to the rest of the, the main bearings and rod bearing and go all over the engine like people are going. It should the trash should go all over the. It's not the way it works. <laughs> Look at the path of oil. All engines are basically the same. There's some exceptions, but this engine, the Toyota engine, is not an exception. If Toyota is claiming we left trash right before the number one main bearing, the trash is going to go to the number one main bearing. If some escapes and doesn't get jammed up here, it will go to the number one rod bearing or connecting rod bearing before that's it. That's the end of its journey. It's done. It will not go to the rest of the engine and foul it up, which is why we're only seeing number one main bearing failures. Now, I wish somebody would actually look at the number one rod bearing and you might probably see some wear there to see if it if it went anywhere else. That would give us some more clues. But it's not going to, if the problem is right here, it's not going to go beyond the number one main bearing and the number one rod bearing. It's not going to go any further inside of the engine. That's not the way engines work. The oil is going to come in here to your number one main bearing and lubricate the journal and bearing. It is then going to go diagonally down here to your number one connecting rod, journal, and bearing and lubricate that bearing and journal on your connecting rod. Then the oil is going to go out the side of this counterweight and drop back down in the oil pan where any trash left over will get picked up by the oil pickup strainer. And so your whole engine can circulate oil. Everywhere else is fine in this circuit because it's a parallel circuit. And only the main bearing will be affected and possibly the number one, excuse me, number one main bearing, number one connecting rod. But it's not going to jank up the rest of the engine because it's a parallel circuit. I know I keep repeating myself. So stop the prattle. It's a crankshaft bed plate, not a girdle. It's stronger, not weaker. And there's no evidence that it failed. <laughs> this is not a car engine. It's a truck engine. It's in five trucks and only one car. And the oil moves in parallel, not series. So yes, only one small area can be affected if Toyota's cover story is true. But is it a cover story or is it the truth? And we don't have evidence that this beefcake of an over-engineer, this thing looks like it's three inches deep. <laughs> okay, this is, this is a tank of a bed plate and there's no evidence of this failing. I heard this is a weaker design somewhere and it's good. That's what happened. No. These things have not failed at all. There's no evidence. Now this is actual image. This is an actual image of one of these engines taken apart and you can see that there's engine shavings where they shouldn't be. 
Now, I don't know if this is the, the shavings left in by the manufacturing pro process in this area right here where the mouse is, or this is part of the journal that's torn up. Uh, both are soft uh, metal, so it's hard to really pinpoint, and the person who took this picture didn't clarify exactly what uh, area we're looking at here. It looks like part of the, the front uh, timing belt cover, but who knows? You know, the point is, this is what the shavings look like, so we clearly have a problem. But so far, Toyota's story makes the most logical sense. But it's only going to make logical sense if you squash all the fear in your brain about things you don't understand. When people get afraid, they start making up stories, which is why education is key. Bed plates are tanks. That's not the issue. It's not a car engine. This is the Land Cruiser 300. This is their pride and joy worldwide flagship truck. The engine was engineered and designed from the get-go to go into this $130,000 triple-locked fat SUV. And oil has always flowed in parallel circuits, meaning wherever there's a problem, it's going to arise where, or relatively close to where the problem actually is. That's the whole point of putting things in parallel. Remember your Christmas tree lights before they used to be wired in parallel? And they were wired in series and one Christmas light went out and then they all went out and then they switched to parallel so you could have a problem but the, the, the electricity got everywhere else. Well, that's the case. Why didn't it ruin any other part, guys? It's in parallel. You know what, Wilma? I heard Toyota design this engine and put it in a bunch of vehicles, and they engineered it and designed it so it would break right inside of warranty. As soon as you drive it off the lot 20,000 miles later, Toyota designed it so it would break, and then they'd be forced to recall it and fix it. And yeah, they, they sat around and they did that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know, Betty. That's what Toyota does. They sit around all day and think of ways to put themselves out of business. That's exactly what happens. All right, all playing around aside, and of course, we're just having fun. We're making fun of this, but I did want to address today the prattle. You've got to educate yourself on engines, engineering, and basic uh, mechanical, excuse me, not mechanical, but manufacturing processes. Toyota says there was an issue at the factories, the robots screwed up, and they're fixing it. Toyota most likely has nothing to gain by screwing up their reputation on multiple thou hundreds of thousands of vehicles. You get what I'm rambling here. Toyota has nothing to gain by screwing over the customer, so this is likely a hiccup. I know in public school... The name of the game is to raise your hand and get an A right away. I got the right, I got it right, and uh, yeah, I get an A, and failure is not an option. But this here, failure in the real world is how people become successful. Both people and organizations become successful in the real world, not because they get it right all the time, but because they fail all the time. They fail fail and then they learn from their failures this has happened before in the past this too shall pass toyota anybody who does anything from a plumber on the streets who's failed and screwed up somebody's piping as long as they go back and fix it break it break down the walls dig up the trench and redo what they screwed up they will be a success all successful people follow that principle Failure leads to success. That's not taught in public schools. They're taught to avoid failure, so they don't understand, meaning people don't understand, if they see Toyota failing, uh-uh, they got it wrong, they're going down, they got an F, they got the wrong answer, teacher. That's not how it works in the real world. In the true, esoteric, third eye of a world... Failures lead to successes because you learn from your failures and you fix your, your failures and they turn to successes. And that's exactly what Toyota is going to do.